the Arizona Signal Watcher DXing video blog. Episode 12, Small Transmitting Loops, Part 1, Intro and Theory. This is what I expect might be the most practical antenna how-to video on the channel so far, as it describes exactly what I've been using to work the HF bands from 160 meters all the way up to 10 meters with very little space for antennas. Some people think a quote small lot is anything that takes less than an hour to mow, but that's not what I'm talking about. Ham radio isn't just for the upper middle class living in suburbia or people out in the country. You might only have a porch or a patio or a balcony, or even just a corner of the living room in your apartment. In these situations, even a resonant dipole of length 5 meters at a height of 5 meters to work the 10 meter band may be prohibitive, let alone something that will work on 80 meters. A quarter wavelength vertical antenna can be quite practical at 10 meters, but there is a significant issue in effective ground plane to provide the other half of the antenna, and the size still rapidly gets out of hand at lower frequencies. A quote effective ground plane may need to be a few dozen buried radial wires, otherwise the efficiency is very low. A carefully constructed set of elevated radials may work, but typically need to be close to one quarter wavelength as well, and thus are impractical for the common situations I have described. One can use a shortened vertical, but it will be less efficient, may require both a loading coil and progressively longer and longer top hat wires at the top of the antenna to make the antenna resonant across the longer wavelength bands in addition to an effective ground plane. No matter what manufacturers say, a quarter wave or shorter vertical antenna needs something to serve as a ground plane to have reasonable efficiency. The old saying, a vertical antenna is equally inefficient in all directions, mostly comes from the difficulty in grounding and or putting up a full quarter wave antenna. A careful perusal of something like the ARRL antenna reference will reveal that without ground radials or elevated radials or a capacitance top hat, all of non-trivial size footprint, a vertical is actually a fairly low efficiency radiator. By the way, don't underestimate the problem some of us have with grounding. An apartment floor, a wooden balcony or patio, concrete, a layer of decomposed granite, etc. are not very conductive, and it's hard to bury radials. A few years ago, the city was trying to install new underground drainage pipes under my street. Literally, at the end of my driveway, they had to use explosives to clear an outcropping of granite to continue their work. I suspect that the ground isn't very conductive around here. The small transmitting loop, or STL, can be the solution to these problems. The STL is sometimes called a magnetic loop due to aspects of its near-field radiation pattern, but the term is somewhat misplaced. I will use the term STL in this video, but when describing the antenna to someone on the air, the term magnetic loop is more likely to be recognized. The STL operates on the principle of resonance in an LC circuit, that is, an alternating current circuit with an inductor and a capacitor. The loop itself is the inductor, and you use a variable capacitor to tune the loop. It is the product of the inductance and the capacitance that defines the resonance, as opposed to a full-size dipole or quarter-wave vertical antenna where it is the length of the conductor that defines resonance. An STL can be much smaller than is practical for a dipole or a vertical and still have reasonable efficiency. Mathematically, the resonant frequency of an LC circuit is 1 over 2 pi times the square root of the inductance times the capacitance. For a given loop, the inductance is constant, and as you adjust the variable capacitor, the resonant frequency varies. Although the antenna can work for receiving at frequencies considerably different than the resonant frequency, for transmitting, you need to be relatively close. Let's have a look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of an STL. First, the advantages. This is the smallest well-functioning antenna type for a particular band. As an example, a loop less than 2 meters across can give good performance on 40 meters and excellent performance on 20. This can be a good portable antenna. Not as portable as a wire dipole, but a loop can be put into an automobile and taken to a quieter site. Also, as in my case, I need something that can be put up and taken down fairly easily, and this fits the bill. One of the reasons that the antenna is easy to put up and take down is that it does not need to be high above the ground to work well. Although all antennas will benefit from having a good ground plane, a vertical antenna requires this to provide the other half of the antenna, while a loop is self-contained and does not rely on a ground to work well. With the proper choice of capacitor, you can cover many bands with a single antenna. I've worked DX on single sideband on one particular loop capacitor combination on 80, 40, 20, and 17 meters. Also, you have continuous coverage between amateur radio bands for things such as shortwave listening. 
a well-built antenna can have sharp knolls at two angles 180 degrees apart. Thus, the loop can be rotated into a position to decrease radio frequency interference from a particular source for better listening. In most cases, you can connect your coax directly to the coupling loop, or at worst, you may only need an RF choke. A coupling loop is easier to make than an actual ballon, and near the resonant points of the antenna, it serves the same purpose. Since the loop itself is tuned with a variable capacitor, an external antenna tuner is not needed for the antenna. Now some disadvantages. While you can access a large continuous stretch of frequencies, you can only transmit on a fairly narrow range of frequencies at any particular setting. This gets worse the lower you go in frequency. If you are participating in a contest or otherwise need to tune around a lot, this can get very annoying. You need some way to properly tune the antenna for resonance at your frequency of choice. Monitoring the background noise on your receiver will probably not be precise enough unless it has a spectrum display. Otherwise, an antenna analyzer or an external spectrum display that can be switched into the signal path will be required. The actual tuning of the antenna requires varying the capacitance. Thus, you will need a way to turn the capacitor knob remotely unless you will be operating for long periods within a narrow frequency range. This typically requires a motor of some sort at the capacitor and the attendant wiring into the shack. To operate beyond QRP power of a few watts, you need to purchase a specialized high voltage capacitor with high current carrying capacity. In the HF bands at 100 watts, a loop can produce voltages across the capacitor 3 kilovolts or more and or currents of 20 amps or more. For good frequency coverage and an electrically efficient antenna, you will probably need to spend at least $150. Even at modest power, the loop creates the risk of a serious RF burn and the loop is often at a height where it is more likely for someone to come into contact with it. Steps will need to be taken to make sure the antenna is not easily accessible to the unwary while transmitting. If you want broad frequency coverage, you may have to sacrifice standing wave ratio on some of the bands. For example, if the coupling loop is adjusted for an SWR near 1 to 1 on one band, it might be 2 to 1 on another band. With low loss coax and or short coax run, this might not be a significant issue. Extra contact resistances of tens of milliohms can cause a significant decrease in the radiated RF power because the mechanical resistance of a perfect loop is already of order 100 milliohms. This antenna relies on ease of current flow. Thus, attention to detail in the connection between the capacitor and loop is very important. The efficiency of the loop will still be rather low as you go to longer wavelengths. There's no free lunch. There are three fundamental parameters for an ideal radiating antenna, high efficiency, small size relative to wavelength, and large bandwidth. Pick two. For a resonant dipole, you get high efficiency and relatively large bandwidth. For an STL, you get small size, but with a big trade-off between high efficiency and large bandwidth. Since tuning at a particular frequency requires a specific L times C product, and both quantities are difficult to measure at HF frequencies, some sort of modeling is needed as a part of the design process. Fortunately, circular loops are fairly easy to deal with, and an excellent calculation spreadsheet exists. Created by AA5TB, this spreadsheet allows you to accurately design an STL to cover your desired frequency range. The free parameters when building an STL are the diameter of the loop, the diameter of the conductor, and the capacitance range. For the HF band, the loop should have a maximum diameter of around one-tenth or less of the wavelength, or a circumference of less than 30% of the wavelength. This helps preserve the antenna pattern with two good nulls. Thus, you need to decide on the highest frequency you want to cover and work from there. So here is the uh, AA5TB small magnetic loop antenna calculator spreadsheet, and I have a link to this spreadsheet down below. This lets you input uh, the various uh, design parameters, uh, frequency, loop diameter, conductor diameter, power, and also any um, uh, if you have some way of estimating how much loss you might have from contact losses and stuff and connections, you can put that in here as well. Now the table here covers the one frequency uh, that's in here. This plot um, covers the entire HF range and gives you the efficiency of this loop as a function of frequency and the bandwidth of the loop as a function of frequency. And this is good for seeing the general uh, shape of this. For the higher frequencies, the efficiency stays up pretty good and then about halfway down it really starts to, to go, go bad. And down here in the 80 meter band of a three foot loop like this, um, is going to be uh, down 20 dB in efficiency or less than 1%. The bandwidth, uh, a nice bandwidth at higher frequencies, over 100 kilohertz, 
but that drops down to a few kilohertz down here at the lower frequencies. And so that is that shows you immediately uh, the issues that you're going to have with trying to work lower and lower frequencies with a particular loop. You're, it's going to be very inefficient, and you're going to have very low bandwidth, which means you have to tune very often uh, when you change frequencies. Now, what I wanted, though, uh, after looking at this, was to have a list of these various calculated parameters, the bandwidth, efficiency, tuning capacitance, capacitor voltage, all that stuff, but for um, every ham radio band at once, not just for one uh, particular frequency. So I took all the equations from the spreadsheet here, and I put them into my own spreadsheet. So all the equations are the same. The difference is, is it, it, it doesn't do any plots, but it prints out these values for the different ham radio bands, 160, 80, 60, 40, 20, 17, 15, 12, and 10. Now, a three-foot loop um, with uh, three-eighths inch uh, diameter tubing, that is an actual loop that I use. And this gives you uh, a, very, a lot of useful things. First of all, it gives you what the, um, the capacitance uh, that'll be needed. And so here on the 10 meter band, um, uh, 11 or 12 picofarads will resonate at 10 meter band frequencies. And so because of the inverse relationship, the higher the capacitance, the lower the frequency. Now, if I wanted to tune a 160 meter band, I would need more than 2000 picofarads. The capacitor that I'm actually using for this loop uh, goes up to 250 picofarads. So we can tune all the way down to the 40 meter band. Now at the bottom you have to be careful because my capacitor is rated uh, from 4 to 250 picofarads, but there is stray capacitance in the circuit of several picofarads. And so um, even though you would think you could tune uh, uh, quite a bit higher frequencies, you can't. This cuts off at about 33 megahertz or so because there is um, oh, something like about, about 6 picofarads of stray capacitance in this particular loop in this, uh, as it's connected. Now you can see the bandwidth here again, uh, about 150 kilohertz on 10 meters, uh, down to about 20 kilohertz on 20 meters, and below 10 kilohertz on 40 meters. So now you're seeing that issue with the smaller and smaller bandwidth at higher frequencies, in addition to the low efficiency. On 40 meters, it's down 12 dB from perfect efficiency, so it's down 2S units or more. The voltages, well, uh, as I mentioned, the voltages can be quite high on the capacitor. And at 100 watts, um, we can be actually over 4 kilovolts. So you have to take that into account in the uh, voltage rating of your capacitor. You probably want a 5 kilovolt rated capacitor. If you, wanted a, if you only had a 3 kilovolt rated capacitor, those are pretty common, you might have to run lower power. And so what you do with that is that you kind of gradually increase the power and keep checking to see if there's any arcing, any arc over um, around the capacitor. And uh, that'll let you know if um, this is okay. Of course, if you get a high enough uh, voltage rating, then you don't, don't really have to worry about that too much. Now, one of the things I want to show you here is let's say we want to go to a larger loop. Let's say we go to a five foot diameter loop. And let's look at 40 meters. So we see our efficiency is minus 12.0. Now I'm going to change this to a five foot loop. And notice we gained almost six dB, a full S unit, by increasing the loop diameter from three feet to five feet. And so that's another one of these uh, design uh, factors. The larger the loop, the more efficient it's going to be. Also, the bandwidth increased. Um, we're at 9.5 kilohertz here, almost 10 whereas we were at about eight and a half before. So we get a little bit of a boost in the bandwidth. Now, the downside though, is that at the higher frequencies, now the capacitance needed is too small. When you, the, these values are basically uh, um, at the level of the stray capacitance. Um, but here at 40 meters, we're starting to get um, decent uh, efficiency. If I use my capacitor that goes from seven to 1,000 picofarads on this loop, which I did, I actually had a five foot loop, um, 
Yeah, the efficiency here is still pretty low on 80 meters, but we're starting getting starting to get to the point where you can maybe make some make some contacts. Now let's think a lot bigger. Uh, um, this uh, eight foot diameter loop that I built, which is actually 7.8 feet in diameter, I'm using one quarter inch tubing on that. And now we see on 40 meters that I've gained a few more dB. And so now I've got a fairly efficient antenna here on 40 meters. And also on 80 meters, I'm up several dB. In fact, at 160 meters, I'm also up uh, several dB. And now, with the 1000 picofarad capacitor, I can actually tune 160 meters. And so, in fact, I, I have made one a QSO on SSB at 160 meters. That was in state and they, they could barely hear me, but I did make the QSO and, and got it confirmed in Logbook of the World. But you see this efficiency is very low, less than 1%. So uh, it's a little bit of a gimmick, but it can be worth a try. But here's the downside. I lost 20 meters because um, the uh, stray capacitance here is actually about um, nine, about eight or nine picofarads. The low end of this capacitor is seven picofarads, and so no matter what, I can I can only get down to about sixteen picofarads. So I can't get a low enough capacitance to work on twenty meters. And it would be nice if um, my small loop, my three foot loop, and my large loop, my eight foot ish loop, uh, had some overlap. Sometimes I only want to set up one loop, and it's nice to have that extra band on in either direction. So, well, one of the things we can do is, is um, if we want, if we want to uh, need a larger capacitance here, that means we need less inductance. So let's go to a seven-foot loop. Now the inductance goes down from about nine to about eight microhenries, and now sixteen picofarads. That is within the range of my capacitor. Uh, including the stray capacitance. Now I lose a little bit of efficiency uh, on the low end, but not a whole lot. And notice that I still can reach the 160 meter band uh, with 1,000 picofarads. Now one other thing we can look at is the effect of the diameter of the conductor. So here we're at a quarter inch diameter. Now let's say I want to go to a half inch diameter. And let's again, let's look at the 40 meter band here. I'm at 4.42 minus 4.42 dB. Now let's go to a thicker, a, a larger conductor. And now I'm at minus 2.75. I gained a couple dB by going to the larger conductor. And this effect is even bigger here at 80 meters. So here I'm at minus 9.6, here minus 12.4. So I gained almost, I gained almost 3 dB by going to the thicker conductor. And so you may be wondering, well, okay, so why won't you why don't you do that? Um, well, number one is possibly the weight, but the other thing here is notice the bandwidth. At a quarter inch diameter, my bandwidth is 7.3 kilohertz. Going to half inch diameter, it goes all the way down to 4.4 kilohertz. And the narrower the bandwidth, the more of a pain in the butt it is to use this because even with small frequency changes, you're going to have to retune uh, the antenna. And that's the, uh, that's the big trade-off um, for a given size antenna. Let's say you, you have enough room for a 7-foot diameter antenna. Well, then you have to, you're trading off the thickness of the conductor, the diameter of the conductor, and um, <clears throat> that trades off the uh, efficiency versus the bandwidth. What you have to do is you really have to experiment around with this. Uh, the other thing is that the thicker conductor actually um, decreases the inductance because a lot of the inductance comes from the fact that you've got you've got this tube and the smaller the tube the closer the the you know the closer the uh, the material is to to itself and now when you go to a larger conductor it spreads that out and decreases the inductance and in fact the capacitance needed becomes larger so in fact also with a half inch conductor if I wanted to have a seven foot loop I wouldn't be able to reach um, uh, below about uh, um, 1.9 megahertz. And this is something that you really have to do for yourself. You have to kind of, you know, uh, fiddle around with these numbers and kind of figure out the optimum values for your particular situation. So I hope this gives you some food for thought when it comes to small transmitting loops. Future episodes of this series will get into the nuts and bolts of how to construct one of these antennas. Good looping and 7.3.